Today on Hawkeye's House of Horrors, uh, I'm going to bring to you the third installment in the Howling series. That's Howling 3. And this one may be a bit of a shocker to some people out there. Um, I've seen the reception of this film. And it's uh, not really a highly thought of film. Um, and I just saw it a couple of days ago. And I warmed up to it. Um, I, I definitely think it's um, definitely better than the second uh, entry in the series. Um, but I'm going to go through it. Um, I will say this. I liked it. But I understand and I know it's definitely not a werewolf film or a horror film for everybody out there. So, um, But I'll give you a review for Howling 3 um at this point now it was written and directed by philippe mora he did the second one howling to your sister is a werewolf uh but uh this time he wrote uh this one and it was um from what i read um he, he was unhappy on on what happened with uh howling to um how it turned out or the additions that were made um after he completed uh his part of the the film if you will um so he wanted to make amends uh so he came up with a, an idea um and that is howling three now the uh when i saw it the title screen um i'm not sure if this is in uh all copies or not but it was marsupials and then howling three after that so this is definitely uh, a title-only sequel. It has absolutely nothing to do with the original Howling or Howling 2. Uh, and I would absolutely suggest to like get that out of your head and actually get a lot of other werewolf stuff out of your head too. Uh, because some, some uh, it's got some different stuff in this about werewolves. Um, that their marsupials as well is a big one. Um, but uh, now this one was actually as well based on the novel by Gary Brandner. Uh, I think it was Howling Three Echoes, but not really. Uh, I never read that book, but supposedly it has nothing to do with it really at all. Uh, but they, they gave him credit uh, for that. Now it was released on November the 13th, 1987 to theaters. And this was the last time uh, in the Howling series that a film was released to theaters. This was at uh, Howling 3. Uh, now, it is an Australian film as well. A uh, majority of it is set in Australia, so that's pretty cool. Um, and I must say, I did not find this film boring like I did uh, in Howling 2. I didn't find it boring. Uh, and it's all the only uh, film in the series as well to be rated PG-13. So it's not a restricted film uh, whatsoever. So now one thing I do like as well that the first two films did is there definitely is some sexuality going on uh, in the story or with the werewolf. So I enjoy that. It continues that course, if you will. It certainly isn't as extreme or turned up uh, to the, you know, really cranked up like it was in the previous entry. But uh, there still is some sexuality going on in this film as well. So I'm going to jump into the story at this point. Um, and uh, the story is about a lovely lady named Jerboa, um, played by Imogen Annesley. Um, who's a, uh, with a group of others in the Australian outback. Um, after she escapes this group, due to a sexually abusive stepfather, uh, played by Max Fairchild, um, once she reaches society or the Australian society, um, she's not really ready um, for what she's going to get, if you will. Um, now, I think... Uh, Annesley does a good job with her fish out of water uh, character. And I, in fact, actually like her character. Um, but she also knows something extremely important that no one else knows. Um, 
she's a werewolf. Um, she knows that. <laughs> Nobody else does, but um, they soon will. Um, but she ends up getting a job in a film called Shape Shifter Part 8. Interesting, uh, because she's a bit of a shapeshifter as well. Um, and that was set up by a young dude named Donnie Martin. Uh, played well by Lee Violas. Um, played well there by him. Uh, now, as well with uh, this film, uh, Faye, Frank Fring, um, he was also in uh, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Um, he plays the director of the film. Um, I think his name is Jack Citron. Interesting name. Um, and he's actually great in the role. And I'm going to say he probably puts in the performance of the film. But literally, he's only in maybe 10 minutes of the film. So he's not in it for very long. And it's really in the first act. Uh, but he is playing a very, like, Alfred Hitchcock uh, style character or director. And he definitely steals each scene that he's in as well, which is great. Uh, anyways, after a night where I must mention uh, both Jaboa and um, Donnie, uh, they're sweating heavier than Rocky Balboa in a boxing ring uh, in bed together. Uh, she ends up getting pregnant by Donnie. Uh, because of this, she ends up in the hospital. Um, and then in steps, although he's introduced like he's actually got the introduction to the film, but um, he is introduced or more, more or less he is introduced to her because um, I think she's like sick, out cold at the time, but uh, in steps a big player in the film, and that is Professor Harry Beckmeyer, uh, played by Barry Otto. And I think he's a good actor. Uh, I don't remember him uh, in anything else I've seen, unfortunately. I haven't seen a whole lot of Australian films. He's Australian. Um, but I think he's a good actor. And he's actually the father of actress Miranda Otto, uh, who I remember from uh, a couple of Lord of the Rings films director Gracie Otto. He's uh, the father of those two ladies. Um, but he is brought in to look at uh, um, now at the same time he's doing some rather I would say unorthodox classes involving werewolves. Um, I apologize. I don't exactly remember which school it's at. Um, but um, after he receives some unwanted friction from governments, governments from around the world, he uh, or the prof, along with Jaboa and another dancer, uh, not another dancer, a dancer, uh, Olga Gork, uh, played by Dagmar Lahova, um, who is also a werewolf as well. Uh, the three of them escape the hospital to return to the wild. Uh, only to be followed into the outback. Now, um, it kind of then leads me to the end of the film, uh, which uh, I would say, and what could have uh, ended on a very nice peak, uh, this film, like it, how it's built up. Um, in my mind, uh, how it could end up on a very nice peak um, and a big shout, showdown, if you will, in the outback. Um, it kind of does that, but that peak isn't very high, unfortunately, and then goes down a different path. Um, makes you feel, when you're watching it, though, as though this film is going to end on a nice, like it's going to be a nice ending with a big, beautiful ribbon wrapped on top of it, um, and a have a feel-good ending. Only, have, only to have Jaboa change into a werewolf at the end of the film uh, when she's at an awards ceremony um, due to a uh, And that's one of the things uh, that's different about this film. Um, when you have like pulsating lights, it will make the people turn into werewolves. Um, so this is not your typical werewolf film. Um, if you enjoy the conventional werewolf films, uh, or more standard werewolf films, you may not enjoy this. Um, but um, I think if you're ready for a different story, uh, 
a different uh, look at werewolves. Maybe if you're a big werewolf fan um, and you like different uh, angles on the werewolf or different stories, I would suggest giving it a try. See what you think. Uh, maybe even a younger audience uh, may enjoy this as well. Um, it is rated PG-13, so not littered with uh, as much adult material as it was in the first two films. Certainly has um, some effects and violence. Um, and as I said earlier, it has really nothing to do with the first or the second Howling films. Um, so this film does bring out different things about werewolves um, or werewolves and I would not suggest looking at the first two films in order to, you know, continue on that look. It's 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 its very own story, a standalone picture going on here. Um, for example, uh, as well, like as I mentioned, the strobing lights will make them change into werewolves. They have pouches on their body. The mothers do to carry their young or the babies. Um, um, now, I do find at the beginning of the film. And it may have just taken me a little bit to get into the story storytelling style or it seemed to be really fast paced, um, like the jump uh, or the cuts or the jumping. But I, I, I see I, I, I felt it moved along too fast for me. Um, I, I would have liked it better to slow down the story a little bit. Um, and maybe just show at the beginning of the film Jaboa and introduce her uh, and her story. Um, and then introduce the prof after uh, her night of passion with Donnie um, and show his interest in werewolves and continue from there. Um, I think it would have been a better opening for me. Um, I think in introducing her. She introduce her character at the at the beginning just, just in my opinion um now i must say i did like it when they went uh that's donnie and jabola went to see it came from uranus at the theater uh i swear i wrote a script called that when i was 11 or something uh it does show a wolf transformation and it does three things that work for me um a it's painful for the man turning into the wolf like an American werewolf in London, which uh, was a staple in my head. It should be extremely painful to turn into a wolf. Um, B, it uh, uses some of the practical practical effects that Rob Bottin used in the original Howling, um, as well as C, it was good, silly fun. Don't take it seriously. It was just good, silly fun to see that. Um, now, as well, Donnie kind of reminded me of myself in going to see some of these films on the big screen. He was really showing his excitement, really getting geared up to watch this movie on the big screen. In the end, though, the transformation is subpar. I really, in my mind, I always have to compare it to the original Howling and what Rob Bottin did in that film. So it's subpar. It, it, no, it's it's not as good as what Botine did. Um, as as well, I found the effects throughout the film they looked a little too rubbery for me. Um, they were there; you could feel it, you could touch it, but they were a little too rubbery. Um, where Botine would add some moisture, you could see it. Um, now, I did like the birthing scene uh, involving what you um, Jerboa giving birth. Uh, in a very short amount of time after she, she becomes pregnant. Um, and as I said, she has a pouch on her. So the baby goes into the pouch after uh, birth and everything like that. And I enjoyed the effects in this scene. I thought it was pretty good. Now, um, to say that, I don't actually really know what the budget of this film was. I'm going to go with it was low budget. Um, it certainly wouldn't be like this grandiose you know, $20 million movie made in 1987. No, uh, it wasn't anything like that. Um, it might have been like a couple million uh, or maybe a million bucks um, 
as a budget for this film. Um, so, you know, they only had so much money, but I like the effects in this, this scene here. It really worked for me. Um, I thought it was good. And I like the effects of the baby. Um, yeah, you could still say it looks a little rubbery, but there seemed to be something a little more there for me to, to see that I liked with the baby and Jerboa as well. Now, I, I liked uh, as well the werewolf nuns. I really liked that uh, idea. Um, in my opinion, that idea really needed to be fleshed out more. And maybe by slowing the story down, and then you could flesh out some of the ideas I liked in this film more, like that one, and then maybe reel back on some others that, I don't know. Um, uh, didn't they? They weren't knockout like as important maybe as uh, Philippe Mora thought they were um, when writing and directing this film. Now I do think they take advantage of being in Australia uh, and making you feel like you're there. You can absolutely tell um, you're in Sydney uh, when you're in Sydney, Australia. So that's great. Uh, taking advantage of um, the setting. Uh, that's really good. Now, at the end of the film, uh, Dame Edna, yes, Dame Edna, uh, played by Barry Humphreys, uh, is the MC, I believe, of the award show that Jaboy is at. Um, now, what this does, she's um, uh, in the third act, she leaves, like, they go back into the wild, and her and Donnie decide to leave. Um, and then you have, like, uh, P Professor Breckmeyer and Olga are there. Um, each of them have got a child as well. Um, but Donnie and Jaboa decide to leave. They're going to go back, um, back to the city. Uh, and when they do so, they change their identity. And uh, Donnie tells the professor, we'll just get back into the movies. And that's what they do. Uh, she becomes an actress and he becomes a director, but they change their names. Um, ugh, but this really brings, it brings a huge question. She's at this award show. Very famous uh, actress. Um, but then their son shows up at the a, a class of the professors and he tells them who he is uh and who his parents are uh and then he tells them uh, tells the professor his mother is Loretta Carson that is uh the name she's changed for herself the pro the professor is then blown away uh that she is the famous actress wait a minute are you suggesting that the professor uh, has never, ever, 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 ever seen a picture of this famous actress, Loretta Carson, ever, because she looks exactly the same. Um, oh, that's hard to believe, but that's what they're going with here. Um, now, the final question I ask um, is one that you can just answer for yourself. Um, and perhaps there are multiple answers out there, uh, depending on how you see this going down. Um, I'll give you what my answer is as well. Uh, as well. Um, um, so after Jerboa changes into a werewolf during this award show on TV in front of all these people there, um, what happens next? Um, well, the world has changed. Uh, the world is aware of werewolves now. And they are aware that they are, I would say they're classified as people. Like they're uh, equals to, to people that aren't werewolves. So everything is okay. Um, meaning that people shouldn't, 
Well, Sam, the majority of the people shouldn't care that she's turning into a werewolf. So therefore, the chances are low that someone will grab a rifle or a weapon or, you know, what, what have you in order to kill her or harm her uh, after she turns into a werewolf. So therefore, the ending does fall a little flat for me. I mean, it is a shocking ending, you could say. Um, but it, it falls flat because of that to me. Now, in saying that, I did enjoy it. I thought it was interesting. Um, I liked it. I, I, I must say I'm a little surprised it's not more highly thought of. Now, I wouldn't say this is one of the greatest werewolf films of all time or, you know, an absolute gem that you must see. But I I think there there is an audience out there for this film. Um, but there you have it. So that was Howling 3. Uh, so I'm going to have to find a copy. Um, I may have to go out and do some hunting. And look for Howling 4, uh, the next entry in the Howling series, and see what I think of that one. Uh, last time I saw it, I didn't like it at all. But you never know. Taste change. Uh, maybe I'll warm up to it. This one here, when I was a kid, I liked it. So maybe in the end, that's what it is. It's a bit of... Uh, um, you know, I'm not saying when I saw it, I felt like a kid or anything like that, but I like this one as a kid, Howling 3, um, as well as the original one. Um, but, but anyways, uh, that was fun. Anyways, uh, until next time, stay scared. Mm -hmm.